today is January 6th. We are in the Marion Berry building uh, to provide a uh, situational update to DC residents on uh, a number of issues affecting um, the district, in particular uh, talking about uh, after one year uh, the insurrection of January 6th in the district's um, the district's response then and our outlook today. I'm joined uh, by the chief of the Metropolitan Police Department, Robert Conti, the chief of DC Fire and EMS, John Donnelly, as well as the deputy director for DC Health, Patrick Ashley. Uh, so before um, we get into um, our, our main items today, I want to give out a big thank you uh, to the DC snow team. Uh, the DC snow team has worked around the clock since midnight on Monday uh, to treat, plow, and clear roads in addition to uh, their daily duties of picking up the trash. So I wanna thank our team for all that they have done as well as serve DC who assisted neighbors with shovels um, and assisted seniors with shoveling walkways. And if you still need service from us, please call us at 311 or tweet at DCDPW uh, to include um, the locations. Uh, we are, of course, watching a weather event um, that is forecast to uh, begin later today, um, to this evening um, to be specific, and we will provide updates about uh, our response to that as that forecast um, takes shape. Uh, so now I want to turn to Patrick to just review uh, some of the uh, COVID-19 uh, metrics that the district is dealing with today. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, good morning. Uh, so uh, today we'll go over the COVID-19 metrics. Uh, of note, our weekly case rate uh, is 2,015 per 100,000. Uh, our daily case rate is 288 uh, per 100,000 as well. Uh, we've talked a lot of, over the last couple of weeks about hospitalization. Uh, our hospitalization rates are staying uh, relatively steady at 4.4% of individuals who have had COVID versus those who are in the hospital. Our, um, we have been working very hard to contact trace individuals. Our contact tracing rate is 41.8%. Uh, it is a reminder that you can start the contact tracing process by reporting your results via the exposure notification tool. We want to talk uh, very briefly about uh, boosters uh, this morning. Uh, so the CDC uh, earlier this week uh, in si uh, made a recommendation to uh, move up the date you are eligible for uh, Pfizer boosters only uh, to move that up to individuals who have received a booster or received their full course of vaccine. Uh, they can now get a booster five months after their initial series. Uh, and so we want individuals who have not yet gotten boosted uh, to go and get their booster. Uh, the, we also uh, know that uh, yesterday, CDC Director Walensky uh, signed off that 12 to 15 year olds can now get boosters. And so uh, anyone that got uh, their completed their original vaccination series around August uh, is now eligible to get a booster. And so those are now available at all of our district walk-up locations, uh, as well as our private providers throughout the community. You can find all of that at vaccinate.dc.gov. And talking about if we could just pause for a moment about uh, boosters, we have noted in previous presentations um, the experience that people are having, especially with this Omicron uh, variant, uh, when they are fully vaccinated is vastly uh, better than when they're not vaccinated at all, uh, and even better uh, when they are boosted. Um, so our emphasis on getting everybody um, the booster who is eligible, now a new group of people eligible, 12 to 15 year olds. Um, we are gonna continue to post our walk up, no appointment necessary um, vaccine clinics. We also want to highlight that those um, vaccines are available in the, in the private facilities as well. Um, so please be sure um, to give yourself the best protection against this variant that is circulating by getting your booster shot. 
and we've uh, talked for uh, several weeks now about uh, how uh, we are confronting this winter surge, uh, and we continue to do that. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, item five uh, in this presentation about the DCPS return from winter break, uh, which is happening now. Uh, and we are grateful to our teachers and parents and kids um, who've done all the things that we asked them to and we're going to continue to ask them to to be vigilant we're going to talk just briefly about getting tested for COVID-19 uh, DC uh, continues to lead the nation in COVID-19 uh, testing and we're grateful to all of the residents who have been uh, taking advantage of that uh, we've got four ways to get tested here in DC uh, and that's through our rapid distribution program at nine different libraries. Uh, as of today, we've given out a quarter million uh, rapid antigen tests since we started that program. Uh, you can also pick up uh, PCR tests at 36 Test Yourself DC locations. Uh, you can go to a walk-up PCR testing, and those are located at our firehouses throughout the city. Uh, and we've recently partnered with the CDC to provide another testing location at Farragut Square, uh, excuse me, at uh, Judiciary Square. Uh, or you can make an appointment with your health care provider. And so tests are available through a number of health care providers in the community. And you can find all of that on our website. Uh, but we did want to remind individuals uh, to not go to the hospital to get a COVID-19 test. Uh, and so we see a, a large number of individuals who are still presenting at our emergency rooms uh, trying to get a COVID test. Uh, emergency rooms are for emergencies uh, in getting a COVID test. Uh, while we want you to do that, uh, we want to make sure we're saving that capacity for individuals that are truly having life-threatening emergencies. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we do have the rapid test pickup locations available at the nine libraries, uh, and we did this week add Southwest Library as one of those locations. On the screen, you'll also see uh, the CDC uh, FEMA site that we just talked about available on F Street uh, between 4th and 5th, the same location as our previous Judiciary Square site. Uh, you do uh, need to register, and you can get all of those informations at needatestgetatest.com. Then we also want to talk about uh, what to do if you get positive, we talk, if you test positive, whether that's through a laboratory test or if that is uh, through a rapid PCR test. We want you to, uh, as soon as you find out you're positive, we want you to immediately isolate yourself and make sure that you are not around other individuals. Uh, and you'll do that following the guidance that po is posted on our website, uh, which is still currently the 10 days of isolation uh, that we want you to do. We also want you to report your result uh, to coronavirus.dc.gov slash over the counter uh, if you have used a rapid test. Uh, and finally, we want you to stay home. Uh, we also want to remind individuals that uh, you don't need to go to the emergency room uh, if you have COVID-19 unless you're having a life-threatening emergency. Uh, and that means that if you're having trouble breathing, uh, pain or pressure in your chest, uh, anything that might be indicative of some sort of emergency, we certainly want you to go to the hospital. But otherwise, uh, simply having COVID, the best course of action for you is to stay home uh, and stay isolated. Uh, finally, uh, we see a little bit of confusion around individuals who are testing positive with rapid antigen kits. Uh, rapid antigen tests are presumptive positive. What, what that means is uh, there is no need to uh, confirm a rapid antigen test uh, if it tests positive. And so uh, if you see the two lines on that test, uh, there's no need to get a PCR test um, because you should treat that as a positive result. Thank you, Patrick. So there's a lot of great information, but um, key to that is take advantage of all the testing opportunities in the community uh, and not go to a, an ER um, for a test. Um, there are a lot of free opportunities for testing in the community, so please um, take advantage of those. Uh, I mentioned already a big thank you to DC Public Schools families, uh, staff, our teachers on uh, helping us uh, get back to school safely today after the winter break. Uh, we were here um, maybe a week or so ago talking about the safe return to school um, that we would deploy to all of our public schools and our child care facilities a rapid test. Uh, we made the decision before winter break 
to use the first two days if, instead of uh, for instruction um, for distribution and testing. Uh, and that's what we did. Uh, and we asked families to upload their results to a website. Uh, DCPS has been able today to um, include uh, school by school data on uh, its website and we invite people to continue to look at that. Uh, 39,000 students, just over 39,000 students as of this morning before the start of school had uploaded uh, their information uh, about their test result. Uh, DCPS staff are of course welcoming students back and assisting any students uh, who need assistance with testing and documentation uh, today. So we uh, continue uh, to be thrilled that our, our kids are, are learning in person. Uh, our testing regime, our surveillance testing regime that is administered by OSSI will continue its normal um, surveillance uh, work. I think you know that one school based on um, the, the availability of staff or the case rates uh, in that building is learning virtually um, through the 18th. Next, uh, we want to talk about a, um, the vaccine requirement to in enter certain establishments in the district that begins on January the 15th. Uh, we have issued guidance related to my mayor's order that put this mandate uh, in place. Restaurants, bars, nightclubs are impacted, indoor cultural and entertainment facilities, indoor exercise and recreational uh, establishments, and indoor meeting establishments. So please take a look at the guidance um, to, to see everyone who is impacted, any uh, exceptions uh, and signage and the like that will help our businesses implement this uh, mandate. Patrons will be required to present proof of vaccination uh, and an ID. The timeline, by the way, I think was the first slide. You must demonstrate that you've had one dose of the vaccine by January 15th and fully vaccinated by February the 15th. So uh, I now um, want to um, be begin my comments on January the 6th. I've had the opportunity to speak um, with a number of our um, of reporters who are covering these, this anniversary of this tragic day uh, in our city and talk about uh, lessons that we've learned. Um, but I w always want to begin every, um, every set of comments with a big thank you and appreciation for um, the men and women of the Metropolitan Police Department, the United States Capitol Police, DC Fire and EMS, DCH SEMA, uh, all of whom um, performed admirably on that day and um, put their lives on the line. It is not overstating it to say uh, that our first responders um, protected lawmakers, defended our capital, the building itself, but also defended um, what it stands for. And that is our great democracy. So uh, I am just want to say thank you uh, and also uh, turn to the chiefs to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what they experienced. But let me just say, uh, leading up to these events, um, like all special events in the district, especially ones that are permanent for thousands of people. Uh, our officers and our HCMA uh, worked with key federal partners and they have been, um, like last year, this year, monitoring all open source information to monitor um, the district for any, uh, for any threats. Uh, MPD uh, continues to ensure a robust deployment of officers available to respond in the unlikely event that any issues arise um, this week. You will remember the morning after January 6, we held a briefing uh, here uh, and we called for four specific actions. First, uh, state DC statehood on the president's desk. Uh, and to make sure that the Congress did everything that it could do uh, and do it quickly uh, to make sure that the people of the District of Columbia were treated exactly uh, like every other taxpaying American. 
I called then for the immediate transfer of the District of Columbia's National Guard from the President's command to the command of the Mayor of the District of Columbia. We called for the creation of a nonpartisan commission to understand the security failures that happened at the Capitol on January 6th to both hold people accountable and to ensure that it never happened again. Uh, and we called for accountability. Those responsible for inciting violence, those responsible for placing bombs in our city, uh, who tried to sh destroy our democracy. Uh, and now it's been a year since those events uh, and we can reflect on uh, what we've learned. I continue to call uh, like all Washingtonians that the Congress must take action to advance uh, DC statehood and other voter protections. Uh, we know that there are conversations now that would carve out voter protection issues um, from the filibuster that has blocked so much um, action in the Congress. And we uh, believe wholeheartedly that denying 700,000 people in Washington, D.C. full representation in the Congress is a premier voter suppression issue. Uh, we also know that we must do more to protect the peaceful transfer of power, uh, including designating joint sessions of Congress as a national special security event. Um, I, I felt more than any other time how vulnerable our nation was uh, when there's an outgoing president and a yet to be established new government. And um, we know the issue of the National Guard is one that is much more than academic. Uh, it became clear to the nation. Unfortunately, the Congress hasn't taken the appropriate action uh, to make sure that the DC mayor uh, has control of the DC National Guard. We also um, continue, and all of my team has participated in conversations um, with all of our federal partners who are investigating the events of January the 6th, uh, and we look forward to their full recommendations. The chief, I know, uh, will emphasize this point as well. In fact, this was uh, our early ind indication um, of violence in the city uh, was when these, uh, these bombs, these pipe bombs were discussed in Washington, D.C. So, Chief, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about that. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> uh, first of all, I just want to say also thank you to the residents of the District of Columbia. Uh, one of the additional asks that the mayor made uh, in advance of January the 6th was that uh, District of Columbia uh, residents, knowing um, some of the things that we were expecting to see in our city, was requesting that people stay home, and our District of Columbia residents did that. I think we only ended up with maybe one person of this whole investigation uh, from the District of Columbia uh, who was arrested uh, the, the day of the insurrection. So a huge thank you to the District of Columbia residents who uh, certainly uh, heeded the mayor's uh, call to just uh, pretty much stay at home. Uh, secondly, with respect to this individual here, uh, this was really one of the key pieces that kicked off uh, everything that happened on January the 6th, the discovery of not one but two real pipe bombs, and I think that that's very significant. This individual has not been captured yet. This individual has not been held accountable uh, for his or her actions on this uh, particular day, and uh, we want to get that information or keep it out there uh, in the forefront with community members. Uh, we are still looking for this information. A lot of the arrests, over 700 arrests that have occurred so far uh, with this investigation have been a result of community members uh, all across our country that have come forward with tidbits of information that have led to the arrest of hundreds of individuals who are responsible for the insurrection. So I would ask, again, uh, that residents take a look at this, uh, tweet it, uh, put it on your Facebook page, and circulate it far and wide. We still need to hold this individual uh, accountable for his or her actions uh, on that day. I would also like to give a huge, huge thank you uh, to the men and women of the Metropolitan Police Department to echo the mayor's comments. You know, to, I, I do not think it is an understatement uh, to say or to speak about the work of our first responders, DC Fire, 
Metropolitan Police Department officers, other police department, uh, uh, other police departments that responded uh, on that day. Uh, there was a lot of pivoting going on, a lot of um, uh, uh, acting in spaces where we normally don't act. You know, the fire department, for example, they normally don't go into hot zones until things are safe. And on that day, uh, our brave firefighters were doing things they don't normally do. The Metropolitan Police Department, not normally responsible for the United States Capitol, but our officers were there on the front line. Uh, protecting our city, uh, but more importantly, protecting the democracy of this country. And I'll really conclude with uh, what the mayor ended on, uh, just to echo that as we move forward, as we move forward and we think about uh, the peaceful transfer of power, I think it's important for us uh, to recognize uh, how, how vulnerable uh, we can be uh, in that space and to make sure that something like this never, ever, ever uh, happens again to make sure that the, uh, the uh, appropriate uh, procedures are in place to uh, the request for National Guard and all those kinds of things that the mayor needs at her disposal that certainly helps the Metropolitan Police Department to do our jobs better, uh, that those pieces are appropriately in place uh, to uh, avoid any delays in deploying the resources that we need. Thank you, Chief Donnelly. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, January 6th was a remarkable day for all of us. On, or, or one of the first things that happened in my memory was that we all came together really quickly and we followed the things that the uh, district government does. Sometimes people say government is slow and within 20, 30 minutes of recognizing a problem early on be, as the Capitol was being breached, all of our leadership was together. Mm -hmm. and. Um, working with the police chief, working with the mayor, uh, the, the director of the emergency management agency, we were able to respond very quickly. And it was an honor to be part of that. And it was an amazing thing to watch. Um, for our members who responded, um, as the police chief said, they were in a way different spot than it ever been in. And across the city, it was remarkable to see our people work our people come back to work to grow the force to protect the community. So it is an honor to lead these people, but they deserve every bit of thanks and support that, that we can give them. And uh, they did this during COVID and they continue to do it every day. So I'm very proud of them. Um, I'd also be remiss if I didn't thank all of the regional partners and every, or, every partner around us. Not only did they help with the police department, they helped with the fire department as well. So we got resources from around the region through our long-term partnerships to support the city and support the government. So I think that's a great day. And uh, I think that's probably it. Thanks, Chief. So um, please continue to be our eyes and ears. I think we have a new a tool I haven't used before. I watch dc.org. So if you see something, say something, it's an additional way uh, to put, uh, report tips. And um, you, of course, call 911, call suspicious activity into the police, um, and use the tip line where you can report anonymously. So with that, we'll take your questions. Any questions, Sam? Uh, Senator Cruz from Texas uh, says he plans to introduce a bill to stop the recently passed vaccine mandate for DC students from going into effect? What's your reaction? Uh, it's, it's another infringement on our autonomy uh, as taxpaying Americans, and it's one such infringement that can only occur um, because the Congress hasn't moved our statehood bill. Congresswoman Norton, uh, it has moved it through the House and it needs to move through the Senate. Until then, uh, we're gonna have these types of high profile, um, issue items that members who won't do the same things in their own jurisdictions try to do that try to do to us also uh, you mentioned uh, congresswoman norton um she uh, is uh, called for the mayor of dc to have control of the national guard as the states and territories do but she also brought up the issue of the president having the ability to federalize the metropolitan police department what are your thoughts there um, Sam, we, you know, um, we had this experience, you probably remember in the summer, um, where we were threatened, a very real threat from the White House, from the highest levels of our government. 
and we, uh, you know, were confronted with this issue where all the, we put together our legal arguments and uh, ability to fight um, on, on legal grounds. Unfortunately, uh, the Home Rule Charter includes some language that makes it possible for the president, any president, uh, to be able uh, to threaten us or to actually federalize our force. I'm proud that I pushed back hard on that and that didn't happen, um, but it was a very uh, real possibility that it could happen. And so these, this change, um, the only way to really deal with it once and for all is to, to deal with it through statehood. Yes. Hey, Mayor Bowser, I'm wondering if there's any concerns among uh, law enforcement officials here about events planned today. I think there's some at the DC jail and then near the Capitol as well. Chief. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I'll just simply say we're prepared for the events uh, for today. Uh, we have a uh, robust deployment of Metropolitan Police Department officers to cover all the events that will occur in, in D.C. Okay, thank you. And then I wanted to ask some questions about the vaccine mandate for businesses that's taking effect this weekend. Uh, some restaurants have expressed concern about how they'll find room to enforce this when many are already encountering issues with finding staff. Uh, some feel like they may need to hire someone to full time to check the status of vaccines for people who are entering. I'm just wondering what's your guidance to these businesses who have concerns about that? Well, we've issued guidance already, and so they can refer to the guidance, and um, we, we are asking them to make their best efforts, just like they do when they check people in to, to have their seats. So the mayor's order says they should enter, they should show proof before they enter, but is a little bit more um, flexible in terms of when someone can at a restaurant or at a business can check the vaccine status of somebody who's entering do they need to do it outside or can they do it when they're inside um, I, I don't know the nitty-gritty of those words but the the um, we want them to do it before they're substantially in the restaurant if you know what I mean before they're mixing with employees and other patrons so if they're coming into a lobby, I'll have to look back on what it says exactly so it's crystal clear. Okay, and then with the religious exemption portion, uh, what does proof of a religious exemption look like for somebody who is approaching a restaurant or a business? What, what's acceptable, what's permissible for a patron to show? Um, I don't know exactly what they're going to show other than uh, at, at attestation from themselves that they have a religious objection. So someone could yes, basically self, self attest that they have an exemption? Yes. Okay. And show a negative test along with that? The negative test is the requirement. Okay. Is there a concern there about people taking advantage of a of system like that? Of course there's, listen. If, you're, if we think that we have pr uh, promoted a foolproof or a, uh, a, a system that people can't skirt, there, there is no such system like that. Um, but what I have seen uh, from when we tell people what the expectation is um, and when businesses set out that expectation that people will by and large cooperate. Will there be some people who don't cooperate? I'm sure they, there will be. Um, will there be people who try to cheat? Probably. There, there is in every system. Um, but we know that if we get the majority of people participating, not just in showing their ID, but actually getting vaccinated so that they can show their ID um, and show their vaccine card, um, then we will be better off as a community. Thanks. I appreciate that. Yep. Can you say anything about enforcement? I think I had asked, that, asked about that when you first introduced this, but who is responsible for making sure businesses are actually upholding this new uh, order? Um, we have, and let me ask, um, I'll ask one of my team members to see if it's going to be a DCRA or it's likely a DCRA or ABRA in the case of our liquor serving establishments that can do um, some, some check-ins as we have done throughout the pandemic for various regulations. Okay, thanks. I'll, I'll follow up yep. on that too. And then one more on, mm -hmm. on the mandate. Uh, restaurant week is next week. Uh, is there a concern, <clears throat> excuse me, for restaurants who are having to enforce this entirely new mandate when we see with restaurant weeks, lo lo uh, excuse me, when we see with restaurant weeks, 
week, <laughs> lots of people come in from outside of D.C. to dine in the city and might not know anything about what's happening here, might not be on your email list. Uh, is there a concern about people potentially being, I don't know, uh, not amicable toward this new rule? Well, I think our bigger concern is that people who are risking, who are in higher risk, doing higher risk activities, having the most protection possible. And that's where we landed. Yes. Uh, if I could just follow up on, on Michael's line about uh, the businesses. There are some businesses, restaurants particularly, that have expressed some concern <coughs> that this is going to create a hostile workplace or, or a hostile situation for their employees having to confront people coming in. Uh, you, we've seen people acting out in airplanes and whatnot. And they're concerned both about be, just being able to staff and being able to staff with people who would have to play this role. Uh, what do you say to those businesses who are just concerned about the safety of their staff having to implement this requirement? Well, we've been, uh, and we empathize and have been um, providing support throughout this pandemic um, to do everything that we can to make sure that these businesses can, can stay open and operate and have healthy staff and patrons. Uh, and we know, we've seen with this experience, with this Omicron variant, how contagious it has been, but also the, the very different experience that people who are vaccinated have. Uh, very different experience, not only in, in transmitting the virus, but also becoming very sick or dying from the virus. So the vaccine to participate in higher risk activities is so key um, to how we keep our businesses open. Uh, and if I could go back to uh, schools and COVID and, okay. and some of those issues. Do you, the 39-139 number for student test results, are those for traditional D.C. public schools only? Or does that yes, okay. and I've actually asked our team to see if we can um, put in one place the public charter schools um, results as well. Um, and so we'll work on getting that so that so that you and other interested people can go to one place for the public charter schools results. We did provide, um, correct, we provided the public charter schools um, with the test. Uh, we do appreciate the breakdown and transparency of the school by school numbers for staff and students. Thank so you. We do, we do appreciate that. Do you have the numbers for, for uh, staff and teachers, test results uploaded, um, to compare to this 39 for students? The number of how, how staff? How many teachers uploaded their results? Um, I do have it. If I can give me one second. I did have it. If that's available, your staff, yeah, I'm sure. I, I'll give that. it to you. I, I, I had a stack of papers. I guess I left that stack on my desk um. <laughs> <laughs> that had all of the results. Okay. Uh, and do you know how many students, do you have any anecdotal data on how many students were turned away today, showed up, didn't need Not yet, um, but our expectation was we have about, um, still about 10,000 kids who we need data from. And uh, there's, there was some on-site ability for the children to be uh, tested today that um, weren't able to be tested at home. Um, some kids were probably given a test to, to take uh, at home, and others probably came to school with their documentation. Um, so we will, we will have some assessment of that, um, I hope, by the end of the day. And then if I could ask uh, for uh, Mr. Ashley some, some questions about uh, some Department of Health questions. <coughs> um, one, it appears now that the um, PCR test home kits are being limited uh, when you go to the libraries to pick them up. Is that, is that the case now that those two are being limited? And, and what, is, what is that decision there? Mark, so we, we've talked a lot about uh, how much testing we're doing uh, in the community. Uh, and the supplies are not unlimited. And so we do hand out about 20,000 of them every day, PCR kits and rapid antigen kits. Uh, and so they are uh, limiting the numbers of individuals can pick up at one time. Uh, and the reason for that is we don't want individuals, and we talked about this as two weeks ago as well, we don't want individuals picking up 5, 10, 15 of the kits and not leaving any of them for their neighbors. 
And then you mentioned the stress on hospitals. You were pretty adamant about telling people, we don't want you to come to the hospital to get a test. And you, you, I think your words, you're seeing large numbers of people showing up at ERs. Can you just talk to about where are we with hospital, the stress on hospitals, their ability to keep up? And then I have a follow up to that if I could. Sure. Yeah, so our hospitals have been great partners with us since the beginning. Uh, we're, our hospital capacity uh, is 84 uh, percent as of yesterday. Uh, so that's a little bit higher than we've seen recently. Uh, we also see that there's a significant volume of COVID uh, patients in the hospital of uh, 624. Uh, it's important for a couple things to point out there. One uh, is that our hospitalization rate is still low, 4.4 percent. Um, but we're carefully looking at how many of those patients are in the hospital for COVID-19 uh, and then how many of them are incidentally in the hospital for COVID-19. And so, for example, if you went in for something else, uh, you may have been, um, uh, you, you would have had a COVID screening, but you were in there for some other sort of condition. That would be in that 624 patients that are in the hospital. Um, ha taking care of 624 COVID patients in the hospital um, does put additional stress on the hospital. Uh, we also know that these hospitals have issues um, with their own staff uh, becoming positive. Uh, and so it's put strain on the hospitals. Our hospitals are doing well. Uh, we're in daily communication with them, uh, but we're trying to make sure that we're not adding any additional burden to them. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of individuals that present to the ER uh, simply not knowing what to do if they get COVID. Um, and the reality is many of them don't need to be in the hospital. They don't need to present to the ER. They don't need to call 911. They don't need an ambulance to show up to their house. They just need to stay home. Uh, and as the mayor mentioned, if you're vaccinated, uh, you're, you're very likely to have a very mild case, but we want you to stay home for that. Uh, so and our call there is just to, to stay home and keep the burden off the hospital. And then my follow up on hospitals, and I and I apologize in advance that I know just enough about this to ask an uninformed question. <laughs> uh, but can you explain to me and tell me if any of the DC hospitals have requested crisis standard of care status, immunity protection status, or are implementing the Uniform Emergency Volunteer Health Protection Act? Uh, so we, we have been in conversations with the hospitals. We did have a um, emergency, uh, sorry, crisis standards of care declaration uh, in uh, April of 2020. Uh, that went away when the public health emergency ended. Uh, and so we are in conversations about what sort of supports that we can provide to the hospital. We have not made any decisions about uh, adding any other um, sort of liability protections or crisis standards of care at this time. Have any hospitals requested that? The Hospital Association has sent us a letter uh, asking for uh, some of those those things. Could we get a copy of that letter? Uh, we'll see what we can do about that. Uh, I appreciate that. And then my last question on this, you released, and again, we appreciate these numbers that you released about the number of DC students who tested positive yesterday. And I think the last number, if you could update that number, but I think what we saw was 1900 or something. If you could update that number. But I'm guessing those numbers will all go into yesterday's test results if, if you add those to the normal, I'm thinking yesterday's numbers are gonna probably be a record setting number for yesterday as far as new cases. Am I working through that correctly? Yeah, we're, we're looking at the data now. We also wanna make sure that we're deduplicating that data. And so we'll have numbers, you know, what that looks like for case rates. Uh, we obviously, we, we talk a lot about, you know, that the data has a, has a little bit of a lag time in it so that we have time to do that. Uh, and so we'll be publishing any updated numbers uh, when we have those numbers. Do, do, does anybody know the most recent numbers for how many students tested positive yesterday and how many teachers tested positive? I do not have that in front of me. We have, it's on the DC Public Schools website, which is gonna be the most up to date. Yes. Uh, a, chief, a question for Chief Conti. Uh, I, I think the phrase baptized by fire, uh, <laughs> when I think of you uh, a year ago, because I think you had just started. Uh, and from what I've read since, um, you know, you were very involved in trying to get the National Guard there and a number of things. Uh, subsequently, some Metropolitan Police officers uh, died and uh, that's believed to be perhaps connected to their deaths. To, to what degree could you share some of your thoughts, feelings as you were going through that, that day one year ago? Yeah, I mean, um, I guess uh, to say it was baptism by fire would be uh, would be accurate. But um, 
you know, I mean, it was a lot going on that day. And not only was it a lot going on, but, but I, I, I have reflected on this quite a bit, and especially this morning. I was thinking about this. You know, I was getting ready for work last January the 6th, four days into the job, you know, to for this thing that's getting ready to happen in our city. And, you know, as I thought about it this morning, as crazy as this sounds, even though the situation itself was, was just a horrible situation, I couldn't be more proud of our city and how we perform. You know, I got an opportunity on that particular day, you know, baptism by fire, to work closely with the fire chief, the mayor, the director of Homeland Security. I mean, all of these other people who were involved in things that were happening, you know, my team members. I mean, I, at that point, you know, these team members, my staff, were all, you know, all new to me being the chief of police. So, you know, balancing all of that and, and ensuring the safety and security of our district residents, all that going on at the same time. I mean, it, it, it felt a bit overwhelming at times, but man, just incredibly proud that we were able to do the things that we did on that day. According to some of the testimony that uh, we heard in committee hearings, so mm -hmm. you and, um, I guess whoever the chief was, I'm sorry, I don't remember, of the, of the Capitol Police, you were like you know, basically begging to get the assistance of the National Guard. And of course, it was a long time in coming. I mean, was this any, any of this kind of unbelievable? I mean, or is a, is a, a lot leader? of it was unbelievable, um, you know, unfortunately. And I mean, I think that's well documented. I mean, I've spoken about that, testified about it to uh, Congress as, uh, as well as the investigators that are investigating this. And I, and I think that as we continue to go through this, I mean, there's been a lot of you know, back and forth finger pointing. You know, I know what the Metropolitan Police Department did that day. I know what the district government did that day. On that particular day, uh, you had local government going to the aid of the federal government to ensure that the democracy of this country stayed intact. That's what I know. Yes, last question. Hey, thanks. Um, I have a question, I think probably for Patrick. Um, could you talk about how the percentage of COVID cases uh, who are hospitalized is calculated sort of because, you know, it sort of speaks to the broader point of hospitalizations are the new peak now, um, but there doesn't seem to be much concern over hitting a hospitalization, I guess, cap or anything like that. Um, it, 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 there's sort of pause, there's, there's optimism about the percent being so low. How is that calculated and is, is that a good sign? It's, it's a great question. Um, and so there's, there's certainly, you said there's no concern about capacity. Um, there's, there's always concern about capacity and that's been uh, why we've talked about since the beginning about flattening the curve and protecting our healthcare infrastructure. Uh, and that's why we, we do talk to the hospitals on a daily basis and, and we've demonstrated our commitment to making sure uh, that they're able to, to operate. The, the calculation specifically is the number of COVID patients uh, that are in the hospital divided by the percent of the COVID cases. Uh, and there is some, uh, I believe it's a seven or 14 day rolling average in there as well. Um, we, can, we can follow up of the, about the specific one. And what, what we're really concerned about is how many people that get COVID end up in the hospital, right? Uh, for COVID related issues. Uh, and so the severity of those patients is so important to us uh, to make sure we're certainly going to see, uh, like, like I just talked about, there's 624 COVID patients in the hospital today. Not all of those are in the hospital for COVID, uh, but we specifically are laser focused on the people that are in there for hospital or in there for COVID, have COVID related pneumonia or in there on ventilators or having uh, serious uh, you know, uh, issues in the hospital. Those are the ones that are most important to us because we want to make sure that we're, we're protecting that infrastructure to make sure that it's available to care for anyone. Uh, and as the mayor said, and just to, just to reemphasize, the people that are ending up in the ICUs and ending up dying are the people that are unvaccinated. We are not seeing vaccinated people uh, ending up in the ICUs or dying uh, if, they, if they have been fully vaccinated. And it's so important right now to make sure that they're boosted. Thanks. I uh, just want to follow up. Uh, is, is there a significant number of the 620 whatever um, hospitalizations uh, of people who are just there going to the ER might not have to be there? Like, is that a significant number we're talking about or is it just a few? 
Yeah, so the 624 is specifically related to inpatient admission. So that does not, uh, that does not take into, so if you visit the ER, that's considered an outpatient visit. Uh, so that does not include all the patients that are showing up to the, the ER uh, that may just, you know, may test positive, may have come in just because they were concerned <coughs> and then were discharged a few hours later. And how many may be there not for COVID, as you say, but they're COVID positive? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I don't have that data in front of us, um, and so we can certainly follow up with you on that. Uh, it, is, it is not uh, all of the 624. It's far, far less than that. Okay, Michael and then Mark. Thanks, Mayor. I'm wondering if you can provide an update on the vaccine mandate for government workers uh, with no test out option. I don't know if there's been any new developments in regards to negotiations with labor unions on, on when that'll be implemented. I don't have an update for you today, um, but we will shortly and we continue those those conversations to implement a deadline and I would um, we'll, we'll plan to have that at a future update. Okay, thank you. And then can you provide an update on snow plowing? That was a source of consternation for uh, city residents over the past couple of days. Some residents this morning are saying their streets streets still haven't been plowed. Uh, what was the lag there? And is it expected to be completed today? Are you ready for possible snowfall tonight? Um, I will have to, when you say lag, you, you mean that there were some streets that didn't get hit, then I will have to go over that, those list of streets. Yeah. Uh, but certainly uh, the, we were pre prepared and deployed our crews and contract crews um, that we were able to get um, because we, um, our crews weren't, we didn't have as many people available um, due to COVID, um, but we had contract crews out. Uh, we got to our mains within uh, the time period that we uh, thought we would, and then we hit our residential streets. So I feel really good about um, our, our teams being able to, to hit and get out there. If there's one thing that we're looking at is if our, our contract crews um, gave us the full, um, did everything that they were supposed to do in the time allotted. So that's something for us to look at. Thanks. And when I was talking about lags, it was exactly as you said. Were you privy of delays or streets not getting treated in a timely manner for residents? Um, I, I, I will get a full recap of what happened, so I don't want to give you a half answer. Um, in the one piece of feedback that we've gotten was to look at to see if the, the contractor crews or non-DPW crews um, did what we expected within the time period um, that they were hired. So that's, that's one area that I'm going to look at. Thanks. And then one question on schools. It sounds like uh, this morning schools kind of went about different ways in uh, getting kids back into the classroom. Some offered wristbands, some were giving out tickets. Uh, some schools staggered students throughout the day to show proof of a negative test. Uh, when students were admitted this morning, was there universal guidance on how to facilitate bringing them in or did each school's administrator get to determine what approach they did? Listen, we have, um, we have uh, some real mini mayors out there and they are public school principals, <laughs> okay? They run a campus, uh, they have staff, they have crossing guards, they have security, they help with you know, construction projects. They are really running a, a, little, a little town um, in this, their school and they are, um, they are highly um, supported professionals and the chancellor works hand in hand with them to support them. So I imagine um, that one principal might do something different from another principal because um, she knows her school community, her building, she knows the traffic patterns, and she knows what works for that building. So I expect that there were probably 100 different ways um, to get kids in the building, uh, and I'm look, looking forward to figuring out what worked. And the chancellor among the principals in their regular conversations, one might have learned something that would benefit another school, and I know that they're, they're doing that sharing. Um, so I am, I'm just really, really grateful to them um, for all of their communication. The success that we've had in getting parents to upload had a, has a lot, of, um, a lot of proud parents. Uh, and the, the principals are, are, are in that group. Thanks, and a quick follow-up. Any sense at this point, given current data available, whether more classes or schools are expected to go virtual? 
Um, expect it as of um, the data that we have. Yeah. Um, we have put like all of that information out already. We had one school um, who couldn't operate because of availability. And we've had several classes, um, and those those parents have been um, contacted if their class, and there are several many throughout the system, um, but not dissimilar for what's been happening in our response to COVID throughout the school year. And those families have been contacted directly. Are the classes is that public information? Which classes those are, or what schools? Um, I don't know if that's on the DCPS website. Could you, could you say that? I don't have that in okay. front of me. Thank you. Uh, my one follow up yep. on schools, and, and it goes to that the one school that was decided. I know you don't want to give the metrics that you're using to decide when a school goes to virtual, uh, but by our cheap math, um, there were about 15 other schools that had a higher positivity rate. In fact, much higher. I, I think the one that you went virtual had about 11% of staff test positive. There are some schools that have as high as a 20% of their staff testing positive, but they didn't go virtual. So I'm just wondering if you can explain why this one school that had 11% positivity rate went positive, went virtual, but schools that had higher rates did not. It depends on if the school can operate. Okay. And so that depends on the availability of the adults to um, staff the the classes and the buildings and it could be we said from the beginning it could be different for every school uh, depending on their program and depending on who was impacted and then I have a completely off-topic question for Chief Conti if I could oh. can you update us on the future of the daily building I know you have pretty much moved over here but is the plan to what is the plan for the daily building and then also specifically um, the, uh, the archives, the historical artifacts that the police department has. I know there's a plan to have some type of museum here. Could you give us a timeline on that and, and what happens at daily? Yeah, so uh, daily, uh, obviously, yeah, I think everyone knows it's a historical uh, building, uh, one that I, I literally grew up in. I've been working and walking around daily since I was 18 years of age. Um, so it is very near and dear to my heart and to a lot of our police officers. However, uh, it is very, very, very expensive uh, to do the rehabilitation uh, for that building and it will be several years out. Uh, I think before the, uh, the funding, I forgot how many millions of dollars it, it will cost to, to uh, rehab that building, but uh, I would anticipate it will be something, you know, along the lines of, you know, how many years ago we ended up doing the, uh, the Wilson building, you know, rehabbed. And, we have people working out of this building uh, here in, in the daily building, and again, just kind of a little further down the line. So I don't have a timeline on exactly when it will be done. With respect to the archives, uh, yes, all of our archives are being moved over here. We're building out a uh, police museum uh, within um, this uh, building here to, uh, to store and give those artifacts a, a proper home uh, since they have such historical uh, significance. Do you have any timeline on that? Uh, that'll be done by the end uh, by the end of next year. Uh, the end of this year. I'm sorry, we're into 2022. Thanks, yeah, Chief. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Thank you much, everybody. Be safe.